granted, a group may exhibit aspects of both the the uh, the theological and sociological. So I'm not suggesting that because I distinguish the sociological pathology that there's no instance where a theological cult wouldn't also be a sociological cult. In fact, that may be sort of like what the Branch Davidians were, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a way. But at least, uh, so I'm not suggesting that one is entirely theological cult or sociological cult. Some may be both. But I do want to be unambiguous in my assertion that I don't consider Mormonism to be a sociological cult. Okay, so I want to make sure that, that, uh, that I'm understood on that. Especially since these are going to go out on the internet, and and I'm, and I'm welcome anybody to watch these these uh, presentations. So as I've already said, confusion becomes, or if I didn't say it, I'm going to say it right now. <laughs> confusion comes because the media mainly uses the term cult in a sociological sense. That's not bad. That's just what they do. So. You know, the media is not going to talk about Mormonism except with the Romney campaign, perhaps. I'm not going to talk about Mormonism. That's like talking about airplanes that don't crash. I mean, news stories are 6,000 airplanes didn't crash today. You're kidding. You only hear about the ones that crash, right? All right, so the media is not going to talk about a religious group that doesn't have anything sociologically perverted about it because that is not interesting. You know, they're going to talk about the David Koresh's or, or, or whatever. And they're going to call them cults. And so then when Walter Martin comes along, or Richard Howe comes along, or Ron Rhodes comes along, and, 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 you, and titles a book like this one, When Cultists Ask, and there's a chapter in there on Mormonism, people are not surprisingly offended because they mistakenly think, well, I just heard you know, Tom Brokaw use this word about the Heaven's Gate, and now you're saying that's what I am. All right, so how does a cult in this theological sense differ from a world religion, or basically, what is a world religion? This is just so to flesh out this thinking, in case you were curious. And I, and I, have, to, I have to make these decisions, because I teach courses on new religious movements at our, at our seminary, and I teach the courses on the world religions. And year after year, I sometimes have these middle groups, like Wicca is probably the, one of the hardest ones, as you'll see in why, but it's one of the hardest ones. You go, where do you put a group like that? And I had to decide, because i got to teach it. So I have to figure out what I'm going to do that semester. So here's what I've come up with. A world religion usually has an origin that's completely independent of the Christian faith. Just has no historical connections whatsoever. A world religion usually has little in common doctrinally with the Christian faith. Not even terms are going to be the same, very, very seldom. It's going to be a totally different animal altogether. And a world religion usually has a significant number of adherents around the world. This, this is my way, and this is just my own prejudice, but this is my way of not allowing the, the uh, Satanists to have the moniker world religion because I think it flatters the Satanists too much. I don't want to dignify Satanism by even putting it in the same conversation with, say, a Hindu. Not because I think Hindus are more true than Satanists, I'm talking just in terms of the academics. Hinduism has got a, a historical reality to it that warrants a, a, a um, they deserve their a hearing, so to speak, and an analysis in which I think a lot of times the Satanists don't really, they haven't earned that. They're more like a, a sort of a pop thing that sprang up in the 60s. I do a class on the occult at the seminary. I'm trying to throw in all this seminary stuff out. Maybe some of you will go, hey, where can I sign up? And last, a world religion would, would not consider itself the, quote, true Christianity. All right? So, you know, Hindus are not interested in trying to convince Christians that it's just another denomination. You, know, you don't find that. Or Muslims are not interested in trying to convince Christians that we're just another, or that they're just another denomination. All right? So, let's turn ourselves then to the issue of some of these distinctions. Gordon Hinckley prophet and president. Of, by the way, let me just tell you this while I'm thinking about it because I just forgot it. I mean, I just remembered it. I forgot it earlier and then I, now I remember it. I didn't just forget it. Now I'm going to tell you what I just forgot. That wouldn't make any sense. Let me tell you what I just forgot. I don't say anything. What did you say anything? Well, it's because I forgot it. I, there will be an occasion to probably deal with some of the uh, uh, very interesting questions about things like 
the history of Mormonism. What is the story of the Golden Plates? Who was Joseph Smith? Who were the witnesses? What is this story? Well, we'll have an occasion to do that when I turn my attention specifically to Joseph Smith. It'll be on that occasion that we'll back up and then deal with the history uh, of, uh, of his story and his testimony and what, how all that developed. And then there may be some opportunities in there to, to deal with some current issues like, well, how many Mormons are there in the world today? Or how is this, their church structured? These kind of things. But uh, it's going to come later on. All right, so back to Gordon Hinckley. They, he's speaking in the third person because of the context in which he's answering a sort of a Q&A pamphlet. So he's not implying by third person that he doesn't consider himself a Mormon, obviously. It's just a stylistic way of answering a Q&A in a, in a pamphlet. So the they there is talking about Mormons. They are usually classed as Protestants since they are not Catholics. Actually, they are no closer to Protestantism than they are to Catholicism. Neither historically nor on the basis of modern association, theology, or practice can they be grouped with either. Now, remember that, that Gordon Hinckley is saying that Mormonism, neither historically nor on the basis of modern association, nor on the basis of theology, nor on the basis of practice, can they be grouped with either Protestant or Catholic. Well, right there tells you, okay, well, they couldn't possibly be a denomination by definition. The movement did not arise out of a, a dissension with any Christian denomination, nor did it result from a schism within any religious society. Suffice it to say that its theology, its organization, and its practices are in many, that should be many, sorry, or it could be mayhe. <laughs> I should have like made up some kind of special mayhe. That's just a really scholarly term we use. It, it means it's what the rest of you say is many. But we say mayhe. Uh, are in many respects uh, entire. Should be entirely. <laughs> Sorry, my wife didn't get a chance to proofread this because I was working on it like at three o'clock this morning to change some slides up. Uh, so, and that's the one way you can tell the true religions that people that don't spell. Those are really the people of God. They don't know how to spell. Uh, entirely unique among today's Christian denomination. Well, wait a minute. It couldn't possibly be a denomination. If it's not, if it has nothing in common historically, theologically, practice, or association with either Catholic or Protestant, you couldn't even say that about Greek Orthodoxy, which is the other, the, the, the other third group of historic Christianity. You couldn't, so you couldn't, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, we have nothing in common with any of these groups with, and then call yourself a denomination. I don't know why he uses that term, but I, I would just say that that's just not true. It's just not historically true. It's not accurate. Maybe there was just no better word to use when, he, when he's trying to just talk about groups because he certainly believes this group is Christian. I don't criticize him for that. I think he's wrong and we'll deal with that. Uh, but I'm more uh, taken aback by the fact that he used the word denomination than he even used the word Christian, because I know that they understand themselves to be Christians. Of course they do. That's exactly what warrants the conversation. But it's not a denomination, because I think, in, in, whether Gordon Hinckley's doing this or not, in my experience, especially in the past uh, 20 years, uh, Mormons that I have known, I can't generalize to whether all Mormons are this way, I'm just talking about the ones that I have known personally over the years, uh, have given me the impression that they're trying to minimize the distinctives, their distinctives, and make their group sound, at least on the surface, just like all these other groups. And I just go, that's just not true. It's just so different, it, it couldn't be more different. All right, well, so are there crude, critical, important distinctives, doctrinal, and differences? Are there these? Yes. And I want to turn our last few minutes because we go to. What time do we cut off? We have to be done by eight thirty. <laughs> Eastern time. Seven fifteen is what. Yeah, seven twenty. Seven fifteen. Seven twenty. We'll split it. Seven seventeen and a half. Yes. And there is a second hand on that clock, so we can do that. Okay, good. Because I think I'm not sure if these are synced. They're not exactly synced. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can draw some of these distinctions. Then now another point of of clarification. Uh, because I'm creating these headers up here, 
I decided that I didn't want to uh, mess with the symmetry and then put in some qualifica qualification like evangelical Christianity or historic Orthodox Christianity. I was like, well, it just goofs up the aesthetics. But at this point, I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to cheat by labeling, well, our group is Christian and their group is not. I mean, I certainly think that's the case, that we're Christian and they're not. But I'm not trying to make that argument by merely how I format it on a PowerPoint slide. That argument comes later. Does, everybody, does that make sense? Okay. But there was just, I didn't know, uh, I mean, I could have put evangelical Christianity just would have been good people looking. So if you'll allow me for the time being to just make the distinctions between us as Christians and them as Mormons by these headings and not let that bother you too much and say, wait, wait, you're cheating. You never made that argument. I'll make that in due course. And I'll do it here in, in the fuller title. Doctrinal Differences Between Evangelical Christianity and Mormonism. And I would submit to you that this is not particularly controversial either as far as you know, this is just what each of our groups hold. For example, this is one difference is how we regard what is Scripture. And another thing too, you get all these sort of caveats. Um, I, perhaps we can, as the need warrants, deal with any given Christian doctrine as to how we know, what, why, why is that the doctrine? But for the most part, I'm just going to more or less assert what it is and just more or less bank on the fact that you know what, why we hold that. Okay? But it may very well be that some of you, I mean, I don't know everybody in here, but it may very well be somebody going, now what is that doctrine? I don't understand that distinctive even on our side. That's fair, but since this isn't really a Bible study class per se, and it isn't really a class in theology, and for the sake of getting through all this material, um, then I'm just going to more or less be fairly succinct about that. But make a mental note, and perhaps it could be something we could talk about off the clock, so to speak. If you say, you know, you mentioned this, why do we hold that as Christians, or what exactly is that as you unpack it? But evangelicals will hold that the Bible alone is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. Now see, right there, even evangelicals are different from some Christian groups. Liberal Christians wouldn't necessarily hold the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible, would they? I mean, you, you know uh, some of those groups around. So, already I'm being very narrow in, in what I'm trying to juxtapose. We as Baptists are evangelicals versus what Mormons would hold. So we would hold that the Bible alone is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And there are some scripture, and you can... Um, and by the way, another thing I'm going to do is, is the, a PDF of this PowerPoint of all the slides, I'll put that on the website too. So you can, don't have to worry about writing all the scripture references. You can get all that. Uh, that would be the same website. But in Mormonism, there are four standard works which are scripture. The Bible, in as much as it is translated correctly. The Book of Mormon. The Doctrine and Covenants. The Pearl of Great Price. There is the Book of Mormon. I have that with me tonight. This is sort of your economy model. Here, you can you can come look at that up close. Here's a real economy model: Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price, actually physically bound in one volume. Or you can get it in a handsome leather bound. <laughs> Makes a great Christmas gift. Uh, but these are all up on the table for you to. This table, by and large, are just some of the materials that I chose to bring that are are Mormon materials. And these are some that are uh, some uh, Christian material back here. So here it is, all three of them bound together in, uh, all three outside the Bible bound together in one volume. Gordon Heakley says this, The Bible is the word of God written by men. It is basic Mormon teaching. But the Latter-day Saints, by the way, that's the official name of the church. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sometimes referred to as LDS. And from every Mormon that I've talked to, they are not offended by being called LDS, and they're not offended by being called Mormons, uh, even though that's sort of a nickname that got attached to them fairly early on, from the, presumably from the Book of Mormon. But uh, as far as I know, it wouldn't offend them to call them a Mormon, but technically the, the official name would be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or they would refer to themselves as Latter-day Saints. But the Latter-day Saints recognize that errors have crept into this sacred work that is the Bible, because of the manner in which the book has come to us. 
By the way, we spent a lot of time on this subject in these Sunday night classes, and we can revisit that. Because I, I will challenge that as being true. That's just not true. But I can't do that argument now. But we've done it to some extent already, and we can perhaps, with the permission of the spiritual leaders, we can do that again on a Sunday night to say, how do I know that the Bible that I went down and bought is the same Bible that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Moses wrote? And I, I, I think that's something that Christians need to be able to, to, uh, to answer. Moreover, they regard it as not being a complete God. There he is with the third person again. <clears throat> Scores of different types of interpretation on basic doctrines which have led to the creation of hundreds of different sects bear witness to the inadequacy of the Bible. Supplementing the Bible, by the way, that doesn't, that doesn't follow logically. There could be other causal reasons why there are hundreds of sects. It doesn't necessarily, without further argument, that doesn't mean that that the Bible is inadequate. It could be that the people reading the Bible are inadequate. That's possible. You would have to make that argument. Which I would argue that's really what the problem is, is you got people that are inadequate readers. That can't spell many. <laughs> Things like that that we have to put up with. Supplementing the Bible, the Latter-day Saints have three other books. These with the Bible constitute the standard works of the church. They are known as the Book of Mormon. Dark and Covenants of Pearl of Great Price. They differ from evangelicals regarding the gospel. We believe that Christ's death was a complete payment for man's sins. Eternal life is a gift that cannot be earned by works. And all that is necessary is belief or faith in the gospel. Mormonism denies that salvation by grace through faith apart from works. Or that salvation is by grace through faith apart from works. You noting these for me? Good works are necessary for eternal life in heaven. Christ's work on the cross had to be in, has to be invoked by individual effort. James Talmadge said this: the individual effect of the atonement. James Talmadge is a Mormon uh, theologian leader. Was uh, the individual effect of the atonement makes it possible for any and every soul to obtain absolution from the effect of personal sins through the mediation of Christ? But such saving intercession is to be invoked by individual effort as manifested through faith, repentance, and continued works of righteousness. Let me just contrast that with what Paul said, and then I'm gonna I couldn't resist the temptation because notice what he says that it's it has to be invoked, you have to have individual effort. But notice what Paul says in Romans 4. Now to him who works. The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That is the gospel, I would argue. And we'll argue it more when the, when the time comes. And there are articles of faith. This was an advertisement out of a Reader's Digest. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this, of all the new religions with which I am familiar, this is probably the one difference that they have with us as evangelicals that they're, mo that they're most forthcoming about. <clears throat> A lot of these groups, I find them, it's very hard to get them to admit that they believe something different than we believe. They try to make what they believe sound so much like what we believe for whatever reason that you have to press them to go, but do you mean it the same way? Well, no. But I found, interestingly, when it comes to what does a person have to do to be saved, they're, they're unambiguous that it's more than just by faith. It includes works. All of them do that. I don't know one that is an exception that I can think of of all the ones that I've studied. Here's uh, from the Book of Mormon. Yea, I say unto you, come and fear not, and lay aside every sin. We'll talk about the Book of Mormon in due course, so I don't want you to think that I missed that part. And lay aside every sin which doth beset you, which doth bind you down to destruction. Yea, come and go forth and show unto your God that ye are willing to repent of your sins and enter into a covenant with him to keep his commandments and witness it unto him this day by going into the waters of baptism. And whosoever doeth this and keepeth the commandments of God from thenceforth 
the same will remember that I say unto him, yea, he will remember that I have said unto him, he shall have eternal life according to the testimony of the Holy Spirit, which testifies in me. So you've got to keep the commandments of God from thenceforth, and then you shall have eternal life. Spencer Kimball, one of the, another one of the uh, prophets and presidents of the church, says this, One of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God. That belief in Jesus alone is all that is needed for salvation. And the the uh, dots here are indicating that I uh, elided some text just to get the two salient quotes together. Uh, this makes clear the two facets, neither of which alone would bring the salvation, the individual salvation. The grace of Christ, particularly as represented by His atoning sacrifice, and individual efforts. All right. Let me add a few more quotes here. Uh, Legrand Richards, in his book *Marvelous Work and a Wonder*, which I have right here, mine is a different cover, but uh, says this. One erroneous teaching of many Christian churches is, by faith alone we are saved. This false doctrine would relieve man from the responsibility of his acts other than to confess a belief in God, and would teach man that no matter how great the sin, a confession would bring him into complete forgiveness and salvation. What the world needs is more preaching of the necessity of abstaining from sin and of living useful and righteous lives, and less preaching of forgiveness of sin. This would then be a different world. The truth is that men must repent of their sins and forsake them before they can expect forgiveness. Even when our sins are forgiven, God cannot reward us for the good we have not done. <clears throat> now notice some interesting things about this quote. <clears throat> he suggests that when... I don't know anybody who holds to, by faith alone were saved, who would, who would uh, agree that this would relieve man of his responsibility for his acts. That's not... Absolutely, I would say, well, absolutely you're responsible for your acts. Being saved by grace through faith apart from works is not contradicted by, but I'm responsible for my acts. I'm just not responsible for my acts gaining eternal life. I'm responsible for my acts for other reasons, which we can get into. So right there, it's just what we call in logic a straw man argument because he's making it. But, that's, that, but we would agree that we are we have to we, we're responsible for our acts. He's also another uh, straw man. Straw man is when you more or less imply the, something false about the other person's view and then you criticize that false uh, rendering of their view. The doctrine that by faith alone we're saved is not a, a confession of a belief in God. A lot of people believe in God don't have faith in eternal life. So those of us who say, well, you are saved by faith alone apart from works, we're not, we don't mean by that that you just confess a belief in God and they're the same thing. That's not at all the same thing. 